Hi there. Uh, it's nice to be uh, in front of you, if not with you, in the same room to share some of the gospel with you. Um, I've in the past, sometimes I've spent so much time developing the title for the sermon that I didn't spend much time on the sermon itself. So I did the reverse this time. I just called it the first thing that came to mind, and we'll see why in a little bit, but I'm calling this as if or as is. And I think we, we know if we say as if, we are communicating some skepticism about what um, has just been said. Say, the um, Chicago Bears are the greatest football team of all time. There'll be someone in the room that says, as if, right? As is connotes that, well, there you have it, uh, flaws in all. There might be something wrong with this, and that's usually something that's on sale, but it won't connect completely um, in the message. But as we see later on, there are a lot of ifs in the section of Scripture that we're going to cover. And as, we, as things get iffy, um, as Paul is known to do, he closes all the gaps and all the loops eventually to make a solid argument of his point. And it's all about unity. Some say or believe that if we could just go back to the way things were, Maybe the early church days when it all began, right after Jesus left and gave the Great Commission, that would be ideal. That would be the way it, was, it should be done today. That would be in the spirit of what God intended. But um, if we could only replicate that, we might have the perfect church. But well, this is where we might have a whole chorus of people just saying, as if. Because the early church was not without its problems, as we know. And we're going to look at a section of scripture that comes from Philippians. And this will be the second chapter in verses 1 through 13. We know that Paul's writing from jail. And Philippians is one of my favorite letters um, from the Apostle Paul. And we can find valuable insights in the second section or second chapter. It's one letter, a few chapters, where we look into the dynamics of what we might call a healthy church or a mature church. And if we had time to cover more, we could go back into Philippians 1 and we'd see how Paul sets up the letter with a lot of um, complimentary comments and praise. He spends a considerable amount of time building the church up and encouraging them. He reminds them how his persecution for Christ's sake has furthered the gospel, especially as he endures that with joy. And it does bring him joy. It also brings him joy to think of how the church at Philippi has been so faithful in these times of, of trial and persecution. <clears throat> he also tells them it's going to get worse. That they will suffer in Jesus' name, and he wanted them to represent the gospel well. So Philippi was situated on the Macedonian plain, and it's along a Roman trade route. It's called the Ignatian Way. This road was a link between the east and the west within the Roman Empire. And the church at Philippi had access to a constant stream of goods, supplies, merchandise, and ideas from these different regions. And they had a constant exposure to heresy, <laughs> conflict, and persecution. So Paul was telling them to hold on and be strong. 
and he told him exactly how to do this. Let's pray. Great God, we're so thankful that we have preserved for us these letters that Paul and others wrote to the early church, and we have other sacred writings that guide us, that reveal to us who you are and who we are in you, and our destiny to be with you. As you created everything that you made, as wonderful as it all is, you consider us to be your masterpiece, which is an amazing thought, uh, very humbling. And help us to hold on to that. And as Paul wrote in, in his time, how to do that, the answer is always, we do that in Jesus Christ. And we ask this, and thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So the church in Philippi was established, you might say, in hostile territory. We don't know how many people were in the Philippian church, but we know from Paul's introduction in the previous chapter that there were bishops and deacons. So it was more than just a house church. It was big enough to need some leadership structure. And it's clear that Paul had great affection for this church. They were faithful supporters of Paul's, even in their own hardships. Paul referred to them as partners in the gospel, not as problem children. The church at Philippi was healthy, mature, faithful in adversity, perfect in every way. Well, as if we know that's not true. The theologian Karl Barth, quoted to have said, there are no letters in the New Testament apart from the problems of the church. So it is more of an as is. We take the letter, we take ourselves as is with our flaws. But we add Jesus and something beautiful happens. So this healthy church in Philippi was not immune to challenges. First of all, their boss was in jail. And not only was Paul not there to help them in person, but they had to help him financially from a distance. Second, Paul let them know that persecution that he had faced would soon be turning up the heat on them as well. And they would have to endure that. And joyfully, he admonished them. Imagine that. Enduring persecution joyfully. These are things we can't do on our own. Third, Paul was aware of division in the church and admonished them to work in unity rather than trying to assert their own ways and opinions about how things should be done. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Don't we have so many different splits or denominations or various church organizations because people disagree? And then they go off and make their own church with its own rules. Well, I hope that the snapshot that we get as we read through the second chapter of Philippians can encourage us today in our own churches. It's clear that a faithful church is not determined by having leaders with community influence or having a wealth of resources to access. A healthy church is not the one with the best sound system, worship team, or preacher. A healthy church is evidenced by its commitment to the gospel and nothing else. A healthy church swims upstream against the current of popular beliefs and trends, and in spite of the harm it may do, endure in doing so. And we say that about ourselves? Well, as if, <laughs> maybe not but with the promise of an eternal destiny in the company of Christ, the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unity of co-laborers in, in this very room, and in your rooms, in your homes, we can say, as is, or as it is. Well, let's read through chapter 2, and then we'll see... Um, we can peel it apart a little bit more and learn what Paul is trying to communicate to the Philippians. Paul says, therefore, and we have to immediately say, therefore to what? 
This has to do with all of the building up that he just did in chapter 1 of saying how proud he is of them and how they've done well in his absence and how um, they are faithful to the gospel. So he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement, that's the first if, and from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, or second if, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion are four ifs, then make my joy complete in being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. I sometimes joke in my profession that if you get three or four therapists in the same room, you're going to have 11 or 12 opinions. Sometimes it's fun to watch the disagreement. Oh, it's fun as we used to do, uh, go over to the kitchen and, and watch uh, Pastor Swaggerty get into a debate with Charlie Mitchell or one of our other folks. And we just love to throw it back and forth, but always in a spirit of fun and unity. You know, imagine what it would be like if it was the other way. What if they were disagreeing um, in a spirit of animosity? Well, that couldn't go on for very long, right? There's always something binding us together. And that is, as Paul says over and over, that is unity in Christ. That is what makes the difference. <clears throat> Paul continues in verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That sounds great on paper, but it is hard to do. I can tell you honestly that us on the transitional administration team um, as we're trying to navigate the next few months, none of us have selfish ambitions. In fact, we'd all kind of like to be excused from the room. <laughs> none of us are interested in making it our church, our empire, anything like that. But we do find encouragement in the fact that we know that what Paul is saying so long ago is true today, that we have unity and we have the ability to come together as different personalities from different backgrounds and make common decisions for the common good. And so bear with us as we do that. Um, you have to take us as is with our mistakes. Um, and there will be bumps in the road. So in verse um, 5, Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, apparently, the next bit of scripture is actually from a hymn of the day, and which is interesting. So, Paul is quoting song lyrics in a way. And I always say, I think songs and hymns are like mini sermons, they're like concentrated preaching. So, in verse 6, it says, in reference to Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. You know, he could have shown up and said, hey, I'm God, I'm the son of God, let me prove it to you. Could have made anything happen. But he did not do that. He made himself low, like us. He made us himself vulnerable, like us. Rather, in verse 7, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And in the early part of his ministry, when uh, his followers... They came to him, and some asked, who will be greatest, right, among his disciples? They said, who will be greatest in the kingdom? What was his answer? He who is great among you will be his servant. 
So being found, in verse 8, and the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. It's not only to be executed. Can you imagine there are easy ways to die? Crucifixion is not one of them. Not only is it horrifically painful, but it is humiliating. It is an absolute, most humiliating and shameful way a person could die, and he was willing to do that. Him, the active creator, the instrument of creation of all that exists in the physical universe, was subjected to the most humiliating and painful death imaginable in his time, in the time of the Roman Empire. So therefore, in verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine that day when that comes, that every tongue will confess Jesus? Whether they want to be a part of the unity in Christ at that point or not, or if they have that opportunity or not, we still have to confess that he is above all. And that's the key to unity, because we can assert our own ideas. We can even be right, but we're not right if we're leaving everybody else in the gutter, right? We have to move forward together. And so Jesus takes us as is, imperfect, and unity is more important to Jesus than us being right or shining, having our moment of brilliance. So Paul comes again with another therefore, which he's famous for. Therefore, doesn't leave any wiggle room. <laughs> my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's hard to refute that. And you can go throughout the book of Acts, or you can go through the various letters that, that Paul wrote, and you can see he can argue any case. And I was thinking, it's a good thing that I trust him. <laughs> Because he could argue for something that's wrong as well and win just on his own skill. But being skillful isn't the point. The being right is in this case because being right means that Jesus is, has preeminence above all. And that Jesus is the only thing that can unify people that are diverse we were intended to have different looks and personalities and viewpoints. And that's one of the challenges of being unified, whether it's in a marriage or in a church congregation. We always have to set aside something for the greater good. And God designed that so that we would have to pay attention to the very way that he did it. So if we go a little deeper for a minute on all the ifs, the as ifs, or as you might say, things get a little iffy, but not for long with Paul, he always closes the gaps so that there is no doubt. If number one, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, well, what makes us Christian? Is it that we go to church, read the Bible, pray, we are good, we lead moral lives? That's not it. Paul said that the fundamental and foundational answer to that question is that we are Christians because we are united with Christ. 
everything we do or don't do is based on that fact as is. We do it imperfectly. We accept the perfection that Jesus is. This should be encouraging to us, even today, especially today, because it secures our identity in the very person of the eternal Son of God. And the Son of God has perfect union with the Father and Spirit. And we are drawn into that perfect unity. But we can't get there because we are right about something or better than our next door neighbors. The only way that we can approach the throne of grace is by the invitation of Jesus. When the Father asks us, as we approach, who are you <laughs> and what have you done? Something like that. We answer, I'm with him and I have accepted his righteousness in my stead. I am unified with Christ. I accepted the invitation into the circle, your circle, the only one that will last. Would it help us not to fall into arguments and divisions if that really was in the front of our minds and not in the back of our minds? If number two, if there is any comfort from his love, for the Christian love is found, defined, and experienced only in Christ, Paul wants the church to recount their comfort that comes from this love. Jesus' identity was secured in knowing that he was the beloved son of the Father. All he did and went through was sustained in this love. In Christ, we are not given some sentimental feel-good story of love, but rather we are given a share in the reality of the love of the Father, his Father. The love that the Father has for his own Son. This is not a love we could produce on our own. It is an eternal love that is shared with us as we are united in Christ. This is a foundational comfort that can smooth over any differences a church may be experiencing. And there are many. <laughs> Loving others tends to flow naturally when we are secure in being beloved. I highly recommend a book entitled Life of the Beloved by Henri Nguyen. Um, don't ask me to spell it right now. I'll just tell you which French. So it has more vowels than it's supposed to, okay? Um, but it's a wonderful book where Henri is trying to explain what it means to be Christian to a non-Christian friend. And it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't convince his friend. But it became a treasured work among believers to validate their faith and to explain in a very succinct way what it is about being a part of this invitation to love is so special, the life of the beloved. I want to share something personal. I got sick. <laughs> I got the coronavirus. You know, at work, I should have mutations from all the sanitizers that we use. I mean, there's stuff that has X's on it, you know, like this, don't wipe your baby with this now, but we're wiping the tables and the computers, the exercise equipment, all of that. We wear not only a face mask, a face shield. People come into the building and they have a infrared scanner to see if they have a fever. And they have to wear a mask. And they have to sanitize their hands. Well, with all that, I still got coronavirus. That was not fun, right? Um, I've never been that sick ever. I have, could not even imagine being that sick. Fever, every night. It got, even with fever-reducing medicine, it approached 103 at times, right? 
I had such a high fever, Oksana even believes I was hallucinating at some point. That wasn't the worst of it. But waiting every night, if the fever would come back, and it did again and again, you know, honestly, I started to doubt the love of God a bit. I really did. And then came the shortness of breath. At first, I could do a few errands around the house, get a couple of things done. I could go up and down the stairs. Well, at its worst, I took 20 steps to the bathroom and was stuck there for an hour because I couldn't breathe. And Oksana sat there, <laughs> coached me through it, breathe through your nose. Well, I say, I can't, right? I can't. And, um, and then I, I went to the ER two times. They rejected me. They wouldn't give me oxygen to go home with. So, very ironic. You can't breathe and you can't get oxygen to take home. If you need oxygen, they will admit you. But I was right there, you know, on the borderline of about 90% oxygen saturation. So they wouldn't take me. Well, I always get worse as it gets later. So by the time I really couldn't breathe well, I would rather die than go back to there. But what happened? I got phone calls. I got people praying for me, people I don't know. The word goes out from my mother to her friends, from all of you to your friends, people on Facebook that want to know if I'm okay. I get a call from someone I haven't heard from for a long time, right? And this helped me to understand, no, God has not forgotten to love me, <laughs> right? He is not forsaken me. He is not punishing me. Maybe he's giving me a chance to see the love that's there all the time. Maybe he's giving you a chance to love. And it's only because of the unity that Paul talks about, the love that binds us together. And so it encouraged me. And I began to pray myself not with timidity, right? With boldness, me, right? Quiet Dave. I started declaring my healing. And it happened, you know? It wasn't all at once. But it happened by relying on the foundational truth of God's love and the love that he modeled through Jesus and that love that expands into the, the followers of Jesus. And so that it's a reality that we can't deny. So you prayed for me. You encouraged me. You called me out of the blue. You held me up, reminded me of true things in my moment of skepticism. In my discontent and anger towards God, you, my friends, pointed me to his unwavering love. This is the same thing that Paul talks about. Number three, if any common sharing in the spirit. We might call this fellowship today. Well, I think it's easy enough to prove that because we Zoom, right? <laughs> If fellowship wasn't important to us, we wouldn't bother. You wouldn't bother to watch the video. You wouldn't bother to log into the Zoom meetings. And, you know, Dwight, Judah, he had so much energy, he could do two or three different things in, in the same week where we all had an opportunity to join in. So we have fellowship. And it is so important you know, that we'll do it even virtually, right? Fellowship is deeper when the world is throwing firebombs at us. We huddle together. <laughs> Isn't it a relief, a place of shelter and encouragement to spend time with people 
that not only believe as we do, but live in the same spirit of unity that Christ gives. Like my friend Richard, who called me and set me straight, you know. He said, Satan is lost. God is not cursing you. God is for you, not against you, right? We used to have a spokesman club, right? So that was fun where the men would get together, do speeches and everything. And then there would be a little friendly, you know, um, ribbing and, and uh, kind of criticism or critique of, of our speeches. And we all grew in, in uh, fellowship as we did that, as we learned how to stand up in front of people and, and say stuff, right, that, that's meaningful. So fellowship in the spirit is much deeper than anything we can accomplish on our own. The fellowship in the spirit shares with believers um, the same fellowship the Father and Son have been sharing for all eternity. It's a fellowship that is received, not achieved. True fellowship can bring about freedom and wholeness in our relationships as we stop trying to control or shape them. God can help us to recognize and experience this freedom and wholeness in relationships. We can trust him to guide us. We may have some relationships that are unhealthy at the moment. I'm sure we all do. There were some in Philippi also. And God may be guiding us to step back sometimes. That stepping back is not to give us space to throw a firebomb, right? But space to avoid more hurt for a little while. And this may have also been going on with the Philippians. So we wouldn't want to add stress to something that is already hurting. But we need God to show us when to do that. And God also gives us the prompts of when to step in and apologize. I can't tell you how many times recently, especially with so many things going on, we have justice issues, we still have racial tension, we have questions about whether the government that governs us and the, um, the law enforcement that is there to protect us, there are moments uh, where we doubt their ability to do that or their desire to do that sometimes. We have people on one side or the other, and people like me caught in the middle a little bit. Um, and so we, um, sorry, I'm losing my uh, train of thought here, but um, the stepping back, you know, is sometimes room to breathe. Sometimes we need to give each other room to breathe. So let's go on to point four, um, and not to gossip, right? Not to say that person is wrong, but to wait until the moment that God brings us back together. Sometimes that just has to be. But I've had to apologize. I mentioned texting. <clears throat> it's not the best way to communicate, right? Nor is Facebook. I mean, I've written four or five paragraphs and put it up on Facebook. Well, that all happened with one finger, you know. And uh, it's just not the best way to communicate an idea. I've had to apologize. I've had to go back and say, you know, I see how that could come across the way you took it. And maybe I was wrong to say it that way. It really takes um, the Spirit of God to prompt you to do that for the sake of unity, for the sake of your friendship with that person. Lastly, the fourth if, if there's any tenderness and compassion, well, we could use a little tenderness now, couldn't we? There are four of us on the administration team, the temporary, temporary administration team. They're trying to navigate the next few months to a healthy and secure place during this time of uncertainty. We don't really know what we're doing, honestly, but we're learning. And we have help. We have no pastor. We don't have resources to hire one, but we have help from our regional director, Tim Sitterly. Behind him is the whole corporate church of Grace Communion International. We're not alone. 
we're learning, and we're facing this in a unified way. We don't have a space of our own. We don't have enough resources to get one right now. We have no opportunity to change the day we meet yet. And we have to face the fact that growth will probably require that we do change to a Sunday meeting at some point. For the sake of unity, be compassionate and be patient. Nobody's power hungry. I think you, you understand that. But we do need patience and faithfulness. Hang in there with us. Paul said if there's any tenderness and compassion, it's evidence that the Spirit is working among them. It's true today. There were divisions in Philippi, and we may have some. When divisions come, people run. But don't. Don't run. People may stay and fight or create dissension, try to manipulate things. What is there to gain? Some say that it's lonely at the top. <laughs> but at the top of the mountain of God, there's room for everyone who wants to be there. Everyone who wants to be there has a place in that circle. There's no inner circle. The circle keeps growing. It keeps bringing more people in. So after the four if statements, Paul delivers the one then statement or the therefore statement, which we have read. That's how he closes his argument. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Therefore, my dear friends, if you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill his good purpose. If you watch the Speaking of Life video that goes with this church, it's not connected to this video. Part of it, <clears throat> I believe it is, uh, I think it was Jeff Broaden actually, he says, you know, hold out your, close your eyes and hold out your hand. You know, this requires trust of each other, the person that's about to hand you something, and of God. So as we move forward in our little community, Living Grace Fellowship, let's do so in the same spirit of unity that Paul wrote about in his letter to the Philippians. We're not alone. We have each other. We have corporate GCI behind us. And we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uniting us. So hold out your hands and close your eyes and receive the good things that God has prepared for those who trust him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for Paul, his faithfulness. In prison, he writes that beautiful, beautiful letter with joy to encourage others. He could have spent the whole time complaining about his hardships, but instead he built up the people that he was concerned about. And as he said in that stage of his life as well, he was torn. He wished he could just leave this earthly realm and be with you. But his desire was so strong to help the people that you had charged him to do that for, that he wanted to stay even in jail, to do that work. That's unity. Father, that unity is still alive because it comes from you. We ask you for it. We ask you to see it, to recognize it, and to spread it. Right? The mountain of God has plenty of room for everybody that wants to be there. Everyone that's willing to go through the gateway of Jesus Christ and accept his love and his righteousness in our stead. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing this time, for being willing to take a moment of your day and uh, to go back and see what Paul has, has shared with us. So as we close today, let's say together the 
the very saying that we say over and over is our tradition, that may the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.